Well, excellent. Thank you. Welcome to everybody to uh, part one of our seminar on the Public Law Working Group. Um, a um, word of warning, part two was advertised for uh, Thursday, uh, the 8th of July. I'm going, I'm afraid, to have to change that to Wednesday the 7th. So you'll receive a notification via Sean, and I'll remind everybody at the end, it will be the same time, 12.30, but Wednesday the 7th, uh, July for part two uh, at, at 12.30. Um, part one today, we're going to be looking at, at pre-proceedings and case management and template orders. Uh, part two next time, we'll be looking at uh, section 20, or, or in Wales, uh, section 76, uh, and special guardianship orders. Uh, these particular areas have received very close attention uh, from the public law working group. Uh, and if I can perhaps begin by saying that the magnitude of the changes that are proposed and indeed are in the process now of being implemented with effectively a start date from the beginning of next month uh, are the sort of changes that we last saw in 2014 uh, with uh, the former president, James Mundy. And you'll all recall him telling us on many occasions uh, it, it can be done, it must be done, it will be done. The changes are then were very significant. The changes now are equally significant. Um, they are not uncontroversial. And perhaps as we go through, you will uh, see my eyebrows raising and you'll feel yours raising at some of the proposals. They are for a fairly conservative, um, with a small c, establishment actually uh, quite new and challenging. And so uh, as we go through, perhaps just worth making a note if you can of the bullet points, uh, but of course the slides and indeed this uh, presentation will be available uh, remotely in due course. Um, two further preliminary observations. Um, really the first is this, the um, working group uh, report was introduced by of course, our current president, uh, Sir Andrew McFarlane. Uh, and he said this, and it's just important as background to pick up the undertones of what he's saying. He said, the report and recommendations are the fruits of intense and extensive collaborative work by professionals from all the sectors working on child protection cases in the family justice system. Whilst the group has been brought together and led by the judiciary, and of course, it's Mr. Justice Keane uh, who led this, this has genuinely been a joint endeavour by uh, all of the many members and others who've been involved. I'm most grateful to each and every one of them. Uh, the working group was formed prior to the COVID pandemic to investigate the steep rise in public law cases coming to the family court and to offer recommendations for improving the system's ability to address the needs of the children and families at the centre of these important cases. The additional pressures on the child protection and family justice systems arising from COVID have only gone to underline the need for the new ways of working that the working group recommendations describe. It's been a striking feature of this work that the developments of the group's ideas and recommendations has been organic and has proceeded at each turn on the basis of agreement across the board rather than controversy. That this is so strongly suggests the recommendations made are both sound and necessary. Uh, it gives ground for real optimism that the messages in this report will be welcomed by social workers, lawyers, judges, magistrates, and court staff across England and Wales, and that after a short implementation period, they can be put into effect and begin to make a real difference on the ground. That is my earnest hope and confident expectation. So the uh, underlying theme is of pressures on the system. Uh, and a real drive to try to reduce those pressures. And we'll see uh, when we look at pre-proceedings 
uh, how there is an intention to divert cases away from the family justice system uh, and so that they are managed on the ground uh, by local authorities without recourse to the courts. The other preliminary observation uh, is a question that was put to Mr. Justice Keir, um, uh, arising out of one of the uh, training exercises, which was this, is the guidance hard guidance or soft guidance? In other words, a gentle steer or is it mandated? Uh, and the answer is, it is hard guidance. This is, there is to be an expectation that unless circumstances are uh, really rather extraordinary, uh, the guidance will be followed. And indeed, uh, I'm starting to hear of judges questioning uh, why the various guidances and templates are not now being followed. Uh, so we all have to be, I think, careful not to make sure we're playing catch up uh, when the judge questions what has happened and, and why it doesn't appear to take the form recommended in the report. So um, let's start uh, to uh, background. Now you'll see these slides are the official public law working group slides, and these are the ones that we're authorised to use really across the board. Um, so the great thing is we don't have to write them. Um, we start off with a, a, a rather drab green um, looking at the proceedings, and the background to the report, as you will see, uh, is a number of things. Firstly, uh, regional variations. Uh, that particularly came to light as part of the working group's uh, analysis. And, and secondly, uh, the growing sense of a risk-averse practice. Uh, and what that means is a decision to issue um, as a knee-jerk reaction to a problem where, in fact, uh, other measures uh, may be sufficient. So it's about diverting children and young people safely away from uh, proceedings, and enabling then decisions to be made swiftly and fairly once the, they are subject to those proceedings. Um, we are told, uh, and it must be right, pre-proceedings matters. Um, so it is about building on family strengths and energizing family support. It is about using the public law outline and pre-proceedings as an opportunity for families to embrace positive change, as it's put a point of hope. Uh, the guidance underlines the fact that just because the legal threshold is met, it doesn't always mean it's right or proportionate to escalate either to pre-proceedings or then to initiate care proceedings. And so it's there to encourage confident practice by reference to specific practical tools that will support local authority practitioners to make consistent, timely and balanced decisions. Uh, the paramountcy of the child or children concern is underlined, as is the need for the children's views to be heard. It's about managing and mitigating risk, working with children and families collaboratively, uh, adopting a partnership approach, uh, and I think something which is different, a focus on accurate and timely recording. Court proceedings should be an option of last resort. It needs to be clear why the proceedings have been issued now. We're all familiar, aren't we, with the ongoing neglect situation, which is uh, allowed to bubble along for years and years. Um, and then perhaps sometimes with a new social worker or team manager or a refocusing of, of the local authorities' intentions, proceedings are issued without necessarily a, a, a single cause. Well, that is discouraged, uh, both in terms of the length of which pre-proceedings should go on, but also issuing without very good reason for doing so. So just because the threshold is met, it doesn't mean one ain't needs to enter uh, pre-proceedings, uh, but where it is necessary, the, the meeting should be held in a timely way, 
uh, to consider the information available and decide the best course of action. The uh, meeting should be chaired by a suitably senior manager uh, and participants need to agree on specific issues, risk and mitigating factors. The factors to be considered will include the lived experience of the child and the impact on their well-being, the length of time social care has been involved, and the support that's offered to the family uh, and in converse the engagement that they've uh, maintained, uh, what assessments have been completed, what changes have already been made by the family, and what needs to be offered to the family by way of support and resources to affect change. There needs to be a tailored plan of action at the conclusion uh, of any meeting, uh, which includes the support to be offered, the direct work, uh, how risks and changes will be tracked, what expert assessments are required, and how the family, wider family members are to be consulted um, or, or enabled to offer support or perhaps be assessed as alternative carers. It is always possible, of course, to step down, um, but to do so and prevent further instability, there needs to be some confidence that the changes sought are achievable and sustainable. Uh, it's important uh, that practitioners understand that this phase is not simply a procedural step to court. It, it, it's not a, a one-way street. Uh, Pre-proceedings are an intervention in themselves uh, and can be seen as a final chance to manage risk by supporting change. Every effort has to be put in at this stage to improve outcomes for the child as safely as possible. If outcomes cannot be improved, uh, then at the very least, attempts should be made to narrow the issues if a court application is required. The report recognises that this is complex and difficult work, uh, and social workers need to use their skill and expertise to support children and families and to manage risk. Relationships are clearly key in this, uh, as is communication. It's crucial that the parents understand the process, what's expected of them, and how the local authority will work with their family and group plans. Uh, important to consider the support that they may need, uh, or indeed support the older children may need. And just pausing at this moment, of course, when you're one's looking at um, understanding, uh, uh, that brings into play the importance of legal advice at this step of the process. Uh, and often one reason to move into pre-proceedings is that it does at least enable uh, some legal advice to be sought. Uh, the working group were well aware, of course, of the uh, limited nature of that advice given the funding restrictions. Uh, they have uh, asked whether funding may be increased, and I think they've received a very firm answer, no. So it's not likely that any of this is likely to lead to greater um, funding being made available by the LAA, which is an enormous shame and possibly a missed opportunity. Um, the pre-proceeding phase should be no longer than 16 weeks, but of course that depends. There needs to be clear, accurate record keeping of the plan and the assessments in progress and outcomes. There's a template plan developed and used successfully in one area, which is in the guidance. One of the features of this guidance is a, 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 a long list of very useful documents and very detailed documents, uh, setting out the expectations, templates for these sort of plans. And it's going to require I think quite a change in um, mindset um, and quite a lot of work to fill out these sorts of forms. Review and analysis are essential, process is required, the outcomes need to be clearly recorded, and the deciding factor, whether to step out, whether to remain within, and whether to escalate the proceedings will always be the immediacy of harm to the child or children. As I've said, there's a useful pro forma 
Uh, it's detailed. Uh, it has a simple layout and, for and format to enable the family to become involved and invested. It, it, it says brings sharp focus, the necessary elements to be reviewed, and it's going to be very important when considering progress. It's a living document which records changes identified and ensures that the evidence that's gathered at this stage is relevant and fresh if proceedings are contemplated. It will be an important evidence of the work undertaken if proceedings um, are issued and should be filed with the application to the court. And it may well avoid a duplication of work if assessments, for example, have already been undertaken. As I say, there's a pre-proceedings pro forma. There's a set of principles for the letter before proceedings and a parent's commentary on the standard template of this letter. Uh, there are some top tips for children and young people with experience of public law proceedings. Uh, as we'll look at next time, there are guides on the use of section 20 or section 76 uh, on case management, and we'll come to that in a moment, uh, and on special guardianship orders, as I say, for next time. Uh, there's a revamped social work evidence template, uh, plus new user guidance, uh, a new abridged um, template for use in urgent cases, and an example PLO toolkit developed by Essex County Council. Uh, unborn children are obviously an important and sensitive uh, area. Pre proceedings can and should be initiated for an unborn child uh, if obviously the circumstances warrant that. Uh, work with expectant parents must begin as early as possible uh, alongside the identification of their needs and the provision of support. It's just unacceptable to leave all the work and analysis right to the later stages of pregnancy or indeed in the early stages of, of a newborn baby. Some assessments or interventions, of course, can't start or finish before birth, and there may need to be specialist medical advice sought about timings, for example, uh, in a difficult pregnancy. Uh, however, a lot of the work can be completed and agreed prior to birth. And if a decision to issue is made, then draft documents should be sent to the lawyers prior to birth, and parents should be provided with copies at the earliest opportunity. Placement options must be considered earlier on and discussed with parents, for example, a mother and baby foster placement, so that early permanence is, is achieved for babies as appropriate. It's not always the answer, of course, pre-proceedings, and, and the report recognises that. Um, courts are encouraged not to criticise a local authorities if they've undertaken timely, intensive work. In other words, the comment from the judge, why didn't you issue earlier, uh, may not be appropriate where the local authority has been working hard to try to avoid proceedings. Uh, where all other options have been explored and issuing is the only safe option, the court will, it said, benefit from work that's been undertaken pre-proceedings uh, and, of course, the record that has been kept of that. Right, so we're going to move on, I think, with a different colour coding uh, to um, applications and uh, case management. I'm just going to check the chat. No, no questions at the moment, but uh, do send them through uh, when you're able to do so, if you've been them. Right, applications and case management. So we're moving on from pre-proceedings. Um, I didn't choose the, um, the building blocks. Um, slightly new. Um, we're moving beyond pre-proceedings and going on to applications. So what's new here? Well, firstly, advanced notification to CAFCAS uh, of the issue of proceedings, a new online form, the necessity to plead the grounds in concise numbered paragraphs, and as I've said, the revised social work templates and a new one for urgent applications. Child's birth certificate or proof of birth, for example, um, by way of a passport of a foreign national child are core documents. 
there's an increased focus on appropriate timing of urgent and non-urgent hearing to maximize participation and ensure effectiveness. It's all about getting the right listing, not necessarily the earliest one. There's an interim care or a checklist to assist good practice and appropriate early case management. I'll come back to the checklist in a moment. Uh, and an increased focus on effective advocates meetings with the use of template documents and filing the minutes before the um, case management hearing. I'll come back to advocates meetings shortly as well. So advance notification CAFCAS uh, at the time decision is taken to issue. A new uh, online form um, and uh, the uh, need for uh, a form to be filled out for urgent applications, uh, giving crucial information to the court. The grounds for the application uh, have to be focused and concise in numbered paragraphs. I think that mostly happens anyway now, um, but it's mandated under the report. And obviously the threshold findings and other grounds relied upon need to be set out in the application. Uh, statement in support, uh, the SWEP, um, the new form for urgent applications, uh, and uh, some discussion in the report about what makes a good statement. Um, Clearly, what is not does not make a good statement is repetition. And quite often these forms encourage a rather repetitive process of analysis where the same paragraphs are cut and pasted between different sections. That is discouraged. Um, obviously, the other element of a good form, um, obvious one is good chronology. It makes all the difference if there is a clear chronology of what has happened. Remember also the need to set out clearly why now, what has changed, why can't this be managed in pre proceedings, what is the necessity for the initiation of, of the proceeding. Core documentation, as I've said, birth certificate or identification documentation. Uh, listing of urgent applications, it must be done. Uh, so that there is sufficient time for respondents to arrange representation. Um, and the court will not list on shorter notice than requested, save in exceptional circumstances. Uh, at interim care hearings, there is a new ICO checklist. Uh, and case management is encouraged at the very earliest stage. And there are suggested case management directions included uh, in the ICO checklist covering really all the obvious points uh, that you would have thought of and in some of the main of thought of. Listing of the CMH will be as now within the CMH window, but to give enough time for effective preparation. And as I've said, it's not necessarily about the first available day, it's making sure that it is an effective hearing with sufficient time for the parents to have proper representation. Uh, effective advocates meetings. Uh, this is, I think, one of the most significant changes. Um, uh, and you will see, if you go on to the website, um, various packs of information, including uh, the best practice guidance for application and case management, which has the guidance itself and then some template documents. Um, these are full documents with uh, not only a template for an agenda for advocates meeting, uh, but also a template for uh, meeting minutes. Uh, and it, it's slightly eye-watering really to look at. Um, the uh, parties not only need to set out the issues in the case, um, they need to set out what's agreed and what's not agreed. Uh, and if there is no agreement by one party, why? Uh, and equally, if a party position is unknown, uh, they have to say why. Uh, orders sought, are there issues with assessments? If so, what issues and why? Is an expert assessment necessary? And if so, why? 
What family assessments are to be completed and by when? Are there any issues in the case such as paternity, uh, the need for immigration advice, capacity, cognitive function, international elements? Is it a case where the child may need to be separately represented? What is the timetable for the case? What disclosure issues are arising? How is the evidence uh, to be timetabled? What assessments are necessary? Has there been compliance with previous orders? What's the required reading for the judge at the hearing? What's the representation going to be for the hearing? It's very much a focus uh, on giving the judge, by way of the uh, minutes of the advocates meeting, a single template to move away from over-reliance on practice direction documents, often filed very late, and come to that as a separate issue in a moment. Um, so a core document, which will be the minutes of the advocates meeting, which will be the first reference point for the judge in looking at this management. Um, so the minutes of the meeting have to be filed at the CMH, and then use of case of template case summary position statements. And we'll come back to this in a moment, but again, there are very detailed templates uh, for these documents. Uh, it is not uh, to be encouraged as a free-for-all, uh, where depending on um, the verbosity of the advocate or the um, instructions given, uh, one either has page after page after page, uh, or literally nothing at all beyond a quick hello to the judge. Um, these are to be reduced effectively to a much more formulaic process. And well-being, uh, a national focus on well-being seems slightly ironic given how busy most of us are, um, but a need to maintain a focus on well-being and that each DFJ is encouraged uh, to make their local arrangements um, to uh, make sure that there are in practice um, directions given as to sitting times. Obviously, the president has encouraged judges not to sit before 10 o'clock, not to sit after 5 o'clock, uh, and to uh, respect um, times for email traffic, um, ideally within working hours, uh, and to make sure that um, weekend working isn't, or evening working isn't given as an expectation or assumed to be an expectation on advocates. So, case management best, best practice guidance. What's new here? Um, well, this will be a welcome relief, although I think we're heading in this direction anyway. Short form orders after completion of the full case management order of the first period. Uh, as it's put the days when the judge has to move to page seven or eight of the previous order to work out what happened, what actually happened at the hearing, last hearing we've gone. Um, the focus is on setting out without long recitals uh, what was directed, who was to do what by when, um, and then enables the judge to ensure that there's been compliance or, or if necessary to read time table. Um, I said I'd mention about case summaries and position statements and the big part of late. I don't think it, there's a universal approval for this. There's a moving back of the time from 11 o'clock the day before until 4 o'clock the day before the hearing. And I asked a question um, about this at the FLBA event because I was concerned that 4 o'clock may become 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock or indeed the morning before the hearing. And that the one advantage of the trialing of documents by 11 o'clock the day before a hearing is not so much for the judge, but also for the other parties to know what new issues are going to be raised at the hearing. Often you just don't know what's coming up uh, for the hearing until the documents are filed. Uh, the answer is that that should never happen then, because the issues should already have been set out, discussed, and the party's positions on them set out in the uh, minutes of the advocates meeting. So case summaries should be short, very short, two, three pages, 
uh, and really uh, only setting out the uh, party's position on any contentious issue. And you should know what issues are contentious, as they say, because of the advocates meeting. Um, we've moved away from 350 pages, and that will be again a relief, a welcome relief uh, to some of us. Um, navigating the judge through the bundle by providing a short reading list rather than editing or filleting the bundle. And clearly that makes sense in a world of electronic bundles. It's not the size of the bundle that's, that's significant, but the ability to navigate. Um, so if the advocates help with that, there should be no need to fill it the bundle. And then newborn babies, strict case management and time limits for that. Um, 26 weeks, um, and we all remember um, how important that was in 2014, and indeed the statutory uh, imperative to conclude cases within 26 weeks. A, a more relaxed approach, born, I suspect, more out of necessity uh, than any change in, in, in a welfare analysis. Really, cases are best concluded as quickly as possible for the sake of the children concerned, but in appropriate cases, uh, extensions will be granted. Um, this is interesting, a more intense focus on whether expert evidence is necessary. So uh, this is coupled with uh, the work that's undertaken by the uh, experts working group chaired by Mr Justice Williams. It is still believed that far too many applications for expert assessment are granted. Uh, that isn't uh, to be tackled by a change in the law or wording. We're not told that experts will only be granted where absolutely necessary or where there is a strong imperative or whatever the uh, next step up would be in terms of wording. Um, but it's to be a more intense focus. How is that to be achieved? Well, it's to be achieved by way of a greater analysis by the judge. Expect your judge to question much more intensely uh, why it is an expert is necessary uh, and to require sight of the um, letter of instruction and indeed uh, under the working group's proposals, a list of, to approve the list of documents that is to be sent to the expert. Equally, um, the days of timetabling, uh, hearing after hearing, uh, have gone. Uh, there is a duty to consider whether another hearing is necessary. There is an intention to reduce the number of case management hearings. And so again, a more, more focused approach as to whether there is a real necessity for a hearing or whether perhaps issues can be dealt with another way for example, by way of an advocate's meeting mid-term, as it were, um, to iron out any ongoing difficulties and make sure the case is on track. Guardians will not now have to file analyses. Again, I think that's rather gone in any event. Uh, at interim stages, one often doesn't see guardians' analysis until the very end of the case. Uh, well, now the working group are saying that a position statement will do for case management hearings. Uh, and this is controversial as well, um, particularly perhaps in light of the new Court of Appeal Authority on stock schedules and uh, the decision, um, obviously, on domestic violence. Um, actually, a focus on reducing the number of issues at fact-finding hearings, no more than six. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out because, uh, of course, a lot of cases require really some analysis of a whole range of issues and how, how those are to be condensed into six number of paragraphs uh, will require some thought. Uh, driving this, perhaps I should say this, it, it, it is a real desire to weed out the irrelevant uh, or the unnecessary. The courts are encouraged, and of course we know from the COVID guidance issued by the president, that the courts are encouraged to focus on really what is necessary to decide. If it's not necessary, then it can be discarded. Um, children's guardians will routinely now be released from attending the whole of a fact-finding hearing. 
Uh, and, and this is new, um, do not list a final hearing before an effective IRA. Well, we've been here before, of course, um, in many court centres, that was the practice. It, it fell into disuse for a number of reasons, part, partly because it caused delay to wait to an IRH before you have a final hearing. It was difficult to arrange experts uh, and um, uh, obviously representation was impacted by uh, a decision at IRH to list for a, uh, a final hearing in four or six weeks time. Um, the parties may have to have a wholesale change of advocates to enable that to happen. I think despite those barriers, there is now to be a renewed attempt to encourage courts not to list final hearings until there's been an effective IRA. Uh, consequently, and this is coming back, isn't it, to again what we've heard before, a more intense focus on IRH is being effective to conclude the proceedings or limit the issues in the dispute. So expect your judge not to be rubber stamping your directions for final hearing, but to be looking more intensely at the issues to see why they require a hearing at all and why they cannot be resolved by agreement um, or, or in some other way. No care orders with children remaining at or returning home unless there are exceptional reasons. Um, the uh, working group uh, felt that care orders at home were uh, internally inconsistent. Uh, if a child is going home, why does there need to be the draconian nature of a care order? Uh, not only sharing clinical responsibility with the local authority, but of course giving the local authority the upper hand. Uh, so um, there is to be, it is strongly discouraged now. So we'll run through these just in a little bit more detail. Uh, short form orders um, containing only information, recitals and orders relevant to the hearing. Um, it, here's one, to be submitted to the court within 24 hours of the hearing unless the judge directs otherwise. Um, I think that is necessary. Sometimes it goes on for days, weeks, the batting backwards and forwards of the draft order. Um, I, I've got a case which actually I was just, um, as, where I'm sitting, um, uh, and the um, I, I'm in the process this morning of drafting the order myself. It's been over four weeks. Um, I've given up. Um, there comes a point when it just becomes otios if the order is so delayed. So uh, a really strict um, direction for uh, 24 hours for the order, as I say, unless the judge directs otherwise. Um, as I've said, position statements by four o'clock. Um, case summaries filed for second and subsequent hearings do not need to repeat all the background information. Um, newborn babies, well, we've already looked at this, um, the need for applications and supporting documents be prepared in advance of birth, and then they'll need to be strict case management directions and time limits. 26 weeks, again, we've covered this, uh, a more relaxed approach. Experts. Um, well, you see the capitals, necessary. Judges must scrutinize all applications for experts with legal. As I say, I didn't draft these. Um, these are the official public law working group um, slides. Um, a real emphasis on trying to reduce further the number of experts instructed. I think a real focus, perhaps less so in the complex medical cases uh, where there are non-accidental non -accidental injuries, uh, more perhaps looking at what, of course, we know historically was the rather routine instruction of a psychologist, perhaps, to assess the family. Uh, and a, uh, there was then quite a focus on whether that was actually necessary, a reduction. But I think the working group considered that that had, again, been allowed to lapse. And there was greater and greater instruction of experts filling gaps perhaps, where actually, perhaps with more social work involvement, uh, those gaps wouldn't exist. As I said, is a further hearing necessary? Why? What's the purpose? Um, limiting issues at the fact-finding hearing. Uh, make sure you identify who the father is. I think that's probably fairly obvious. 
uh, a renewed emphasis on the importance of judicial continuity. This all only works or best works in the context of a judge saying, this is how Mr. Justice Kean expressed it. Look, I know the case. I know what the issues are already. I know the background. What I need to know in preparation for a case management hearing is what do I need to decide? What are the new issues? What's the new information? Um, so it, it, the shorter documents, the shorter orders, um, really tie in with the need for judicial continuity because obviously with a new judge, uh, they won't know the background uh, or, or, or the issues that have already been decided. Um, we've already covered, do not list the final hearing before an effective IRH. Care orders at home, you need exceptional reasons, must not be used as a vehicle for provision of support and services. Um, I just highlight that for a moment. It, it chimes with uh, something that's uh, said in relation to special guardianship orders that uh, there should not be a supervision order made alongside special guardianship orders. Um, my experience has been that sometimes that is the only bit by which a local authority will provide the necessary level of support. And it's the same here. Um, there, we are routinely told that budgets are stretched uh, and that um, there are separate budgets for uh, children who are looked after and children who are in need under section 17. Uh, and um, whilst one entirely understands uh, why it's said that a care order at home is inconsistent, um, one hopes very much that it will not lead to a lower level of support at that crucial time sometimes when a child is returning back to parents. One would want, not want to see a breakdown of, of that arrangement. And then a question as to whether that breakdown was because of a lack of support or services. So perhaps a renewed focus on the other hand, and making sure that the care plan is watertight and there is adequate support and services provided for the family. Um, right. And that it takes us to our conclusion. And we've got 15 minutes for questions. So um, let me just see what we've got. Um, we've got a question um, from uh, Jackie Tyler. Uh, is there any guidance around the time scale for legal documents to be available to parents and lawyers pre-birth? Um, I think not. Um, there is an emphasis on making sure uh, they are available in good time and an emphasis on making sure uh, that there is going to be uh, proper medical advice uh, received as to the capability of a particular mother uh, to manage this process alongside what might be a difficult pregnancy. But I don't think there is any guidance as to precise timescales uh, for uh, legal documents to be available. Uh, uh, good question. Uh, um, from uh, Gaza Hill, uh, um, do we know whether the local authority or the child solicitor has to complete the advocates meeting template? Um, this has been debated quite a bit in some of the events that I've attended. Um, the answer is there isn't guidance about this, but I think there is an expectation that like many other things, the duty and, and quite extensive duty is likely to fall on the local authority advocate to complete the template. Um, at the moment, whilst in some cases uh, the guardian takes the lead with advocates meetings, I think there's an increasing tendency uh, for uh, it to be the local authority that sends out the agenda. And then um, if there are minutes taken, it um, includes the minutes. I mean, an interesting point on that, it, it, it's not so much minutes. Um, sometimes one sees a verbatim account of the advocates meeting or, or a, perhaps a summary of what was dis discussed and decided. It's neither of those two. It's quite a formulaic list of questions and answers um, that, that will need to be provided. 
So my suspicion is that this will fall largely on the shoulders of the local authority. But of course, if there's agreement that the child solicitor will do it, then that if the child solicitor can, of course, do so. Uh, Sarah Ashby, hello, Sarah. Uh, what is the thoughts around whether there are enough local authority and social work resources to make these plans effective? Um, well, deep sigh at this point. Um, resources are issues that, that come into a number of these reports, but if I may say so, perhaps they're not issues that are capable of being tackled um, by the working group alone. And uh, I don't see anywhere any commitment from central government effectively to ensure that local authorities are resourced in any different way to make these plans effective. Um, I think what one perhaps has to see is this is largely judge-led uh, and practitioner-led. And as we often see, uh, if a particular service, for example, the court service is becoming overwhelmed, sometimes the only solution can be to divert um, cases or families elsewhere. Now, whether one is resourcing differently, that alternative provision is a very good question, um, but I don't think it's going to stop um, the working group from having effectively said that we just can't manage the volume of cases that are currently coming before the court, and therefore we have to find a different way. I expect local authorities uh, will view with some dismay um, some of the extra burdens that will be imposed upon them. Um, can we provide a link to where uh, we can provide these templates? Um, if you simply Google public law working group, uh, you will come up with the front page, uh, which has the uh, president's introduction um, on the uh, gov.uk website, uh, and uh, then has all of the links to the various reports. So yes, of course, we can provide a link. Um, and if I get a minute, I could put it into the chat, um, but um, it's, it's readily available. Um, question from Neil Patek, again, the question and hello, Neil. Uh, what about transitions home? Uh, will these be done under an interim care order, an extension to proceedings with expectation that there will not need to be a final care order when the transition has happened? Yes, I think that that has to be right. I mean, it's consistent with uh, really all of the guidance, particularly under, uh, it, under um, special guardianship orders. Uh, the route, we all remember very well that the route to return home um, or new placement with family was an interim care order. Uh, that rather fell into disuse, particularly with um, section, um, with the 26 weeks and, and the uh, imperative to conclude proceedings. But I think we will find that um, the interim orders will be used as a way of extending the proceedings. Um, the alternative, I suppose, could be an interim child arrangements order uh, with the proceedings continuing, though uh, that may impact sometimes on parties' legal aid funding. Um, I, don't, I don't see anything here that prevents an interim care order. Uh, I think really the direction is to prevent final care orders being made with, of course, all, all then the, the complexities that arose. And we remember a few years ago, uh, the, uh, it was a decision of Mr Justice Baker, as he then was, setting out the steps that a local authority had to take uh, when seeking to remove a child who's placed at home under a final care order um, when proceedings, of course, had come to an end and the possibility of an injunction being granted to prevent such removal. 
uh, really an imperative not to remove unless really the circumstances would be equivalent to justifying removal under an interim care order. That's unlikely now to be a very relevant area of law because um, the orders shouldn't be made in the first place. So coming back to Neil's question, so yes, I think transitions at home would still qualify under interim care orders, um, but obviously uh, once the proceedings come to an end, uh, there ought to be a final private law order or maybe no order. And I see uh, Sean saying that um, we will send out the, um, the link along with the slides. And yes, uh, I'm happy to give Sean the link so that it can be sent out to everybody as I say, I don't think it's that difficult to find. Um, right, let's have a look at the time. A last few minutes for questions. I can see one from uh, Kate Patel. Will SGO transitions also extend proceedings if no supervision order? Um, so we'll, we'll look at this uh, with um, in relation to special guardianship orders, but the, the simple answer is yes, it will. Um, there will um, there is uh, guidance within the special guardianship section saying that um, really family placements will themselves be often be a very good reason to extend beyond twenty six weeks. You're right to point to the fact that, again, it was really a device that came more to the fore because of 26 weeks. So where there was uncertainty about the placement, is it, is it right? Is it not? Then the answer to that uncertainty was to impose a supervision order. That was wrong, says the working group. The answer to the uncertainty is to extend the proceedings. Um, don't make a supervision order because, again, a bit like a care order at home, it, it's, it, it's contradictory. You either trust this family, in which case it, and you're confident the placement will succeed, in which case you don't need a supervision order, or you don't, in which case really there needs to be further inquiry. Um, don't make an unconfident placement uh, decision. Um, so, yes, um, it's likely that proceedings uh, where there are family placements involved are likely to take longer as a result of this. Right, excellent. Well, um, I think that is probably, unless I'll recheck the chat, um, but that is probably brings us to a conclusion. Can I thank you uh, for attending? I'm sorry uh, if it's been a lot of information in a relatively short space of time. Um, can I remind everybody of the change of date? It'll be uh, Wednesday, uh, the 7th of July at 12.30 for the uh, second part of this, when I shall be looking at um, Section 20, uh, or in Wales, Section 76 placements, and the new guidance on those, uh, alongside uh, a more detailed look at special guardianship orders and the new guidance on those. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you for attending. Um, it's a shame uh, we couldn't do it in person. Um, hopefully soon we'll be back to in-person seminars and I look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you very much. <laughs>